Shalom. Welcome back to Rabbi Kaufman's Understanding the World. I'm joined in the studio by Mark Finkelstein, and we have all kinds of stuff to talk about. Uh, before I forget, I don't want to forget, uh, this uh, Saturday night, I am going to be one of, well, I'm, I'm one of the 36 rabbis shaved for the brave, uh, which is not shaving my face, it's actually shaving my head. So I'm going to look something like this, as my, as my daughter said uh, as uh, she came up to me and patted my hair down to see what I would look like with no hair on. Um, uh, we're shaving uh, about actually 97, 98 rabbis at this point. Uh, we'll be shaving our heads to raise um, money for childhood cancer research and also um, to raise awareness about childhood cancer. I'm really shaving my head as well in um, in support and solidarity for uh, the the many uh, survivors of uh, various types of cancer in our community, uh, adult men and women both, uh, as well as children. Uh, and um, I think it's important to raise awareness and to show caring and support, and that's what I'm going to do. And if we can have a little fun with it while we're at it, that's fine. Uh, but as I said, I don't think it's particularly brave of me to do that. I think it's, it's like fasting uh, in support of those who are hungry, uh, and um, uh, it's, it's something that certainly will make me feel good to do, but I think it'll also make uh, others feel good uh, to feel appreciated and cared for, and, and that's really the purpose of it. Uh, so I, I'm uh, doing that. You can go to, um, you can find uh, 36 Rabbis Shave for the Brave uh, online, and uh, you can make a donation to uh, to me if you'd like, David J. Kaufman, or you can make a donation to anyone else uh, there. You can make a donation to the entire project, uh, which is attempting to raise five hundred and forty thousand dollars for cancer research. We're actually closing in on five hundred thousand dollars, as I understand it, uh, and uh, it's a real worthy cause, and I hope you'll consider it. Um, so with all that, where should we start, Mark? There's a whole lot going on here. Perhaps with the release of prisoners. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> you know, part of the, the process that, that Israel and the Palestinians have engaged in with the United States um, has involved the, the incremental release of a number of people who were in Israeli custody uh, because of involvement in terrorism, other things. And some things really have, as far as I understand it, have nothing to do with terrorism against Israel. Some of them are actually domestic crimes, right? Yeah, but, but they're not uh, uh, streetwalkers. And, and not. these are, I mean, they're murderers, they're, they're rapists, they're all kinds of things as far as I understand. In this, but they're in not this jaywalkers. Group. And they're, and yeah. they're um, you know, these are people who are Palestinians, that, including in the new batch, Israeli, Pal Israeli citizens, as I understand it. Uh, and um, it's, there's concern now that the Israelis have, have released a significant number of these prisoners and literally have gotten absolutely nothing in return other than the Palestinians sitting down at the table and pretending to negotiate, which at this point they're not even pretending to do. Well, the, the first thing is then when these criminals are repatriated to Ramallah, they're given a hero's welcome to begin with, which is... Which is offensive. Which is very offensive to begin with. And uh, it uh, unfortunately follows a whole history of, uh, uh, of exchange of, of prisoners, and usually the exchange rate is uh, detrimental to Israel. Well, and some of these people end up launching attacks against Israel after they're released, even if it's not every one. You know, it, it, there's, there's, it, it's still a significant number. Um, but in the meantime, you know, it, Israel is not seeing any return on its investment. What's the return on the investment? Um, the United States right now is actually trying to negotiate to get Israel to release the prisoners, to get Abbas to stay at the table. And it, it was even brought up the other day that, that maybe the United States would release Jonathan Pollard in exchange for Israel re re releasing a bunch of murderers. What kind of negotiation is that? I mean, the first thing is that it proves that Jonathan Pollard is being held for political reasons right, and, not for, right. and not for any other reason, because yeah. otherwise they wouldn't even consider that. Yeah. And second of all, uh, it, it shows that there's no faith involved in the process, that the, that the United States is having to, uh, having to make a concession to Israel because the Palestinians won't. Well, if the Palestinians won't, what's the purpose of releasing them to begin with? Yeah, because it seemed to be part of the initial bargain to get them to the table, and uh, Abbas is is uh, referring to this bargain, essentially, 
uh, to keep the, the process going. But the latest we've heard was Netanyahu said we will release the prisoners if, if you agree to extend the uh, negotiations to begin with. Have you heard that? Yeah, I mean, I, we heard that today. I, I don't know what necessarily the purpose of extending negotiations that aren't working is, but it, that's that's a whole... Well, you know, I mean, if the idea is to stave off the United States and Europe having to act based on it, that's a different thing. But at this point, it looks like the Palestinian side is digging in its heels. It doesn't like the pos- negotiating position it's in, and it wants to fight diplomatic war again. Uh, and this has been the process ever since this started in the in 1990s. It's been, let's see what we can get at the negotiating table. If we can't get what we want at the negotiating we table, we're going to leave the negotiating table and yeah. make, threats. make threats. And this is exactly what's happening over and over and over again. So the Israelis are looking at a situation in which they've already released a number of prisoners, and all they've been able to do is negotiate with the Palestinians and have the Palestinians tell them they're not going to make any compromise. Well, the last time I guess the negotiations were really face-to-face were in November, last November to begin with. Yeah, I mean, so so we're talking about a, a process that seems like it's not going anywhere. In the meantime, it's basically the signature thing for John Kerry. Yeah, uh, d- two things. So f- first of all, uh, underlying this is the possibility of the release of uh, Marwan Barghouti. Even well, though his name is not on, on the list, it's been speculated that Barghouti is perhaps the only Palestinian who's still in jail who can really bring together the sides to concord a, a peace deal. What do you think about that? Well, if that? that's the case, why would Abbas want to negotiate? He wouldn't. Right? Abbas would want him released. Uh, unless, of course, Abbas really wants to retire, as any 80-year-old probably would. Well, yeah, but I don't know that you necessarily want him to come in and then, you know, I mean, we know that there's all kinds of, of political, of political shenanigans. shenanigans going yeah. on on the Palestinian side, that's including sure. probably uh, a good bit of corruption. And if Barghouti comes out and throws out, comes out of jail and throws the other people out of power and finds out that, you know, things have not been handled the way they should be handled, then there are a lot of people who'd be under threat. Whether that's a boss or other people, there's there, there are going to be a group of people who are going to be concerned about that. In addition, you're talking about a shift of power away from the Abbas faction of Fatah to Barghouti's faction, which is much more militant. I mean, Barghouti, there's a reason barghouti has been incarcerated. Barghouti was Al-Aqsa Brigade, Al-Aqsa yeah. Martyrs Brigade. Right. So this is a guy who never renounced violence. He's not part of the let's negotiate peace part of Fatah. He's part of the let's continue fighting part of Fatah. Right. Now, on the other hand, uh, Kerry seems to have backtrack on the release of his uh, uh, plan well, there's no plan because neither side. If the Palestinians don't agree to it, you're either talking about an imposed agreement from the United States, yeah, which is not going to happen, uh, yeah. or or you're 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 talking about you're either talking about at this point something that the Israelis can agree to that the Palestinians can't agree to, which is actually the most likely to achieve peace, or, or you're talking about something the Palestinians can agree to that the Israelis won't, which is a non-starter because the Israelis are the ones who are controlling the territory right now. Or, or a third option is uh, neither side can agree to it. Yeah, but I mean, if if you come up with something that neither side can agree to, you're 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 even in less, <laughs> you're, you're even less effective. Well, you're less um, effective, but you have a reason to either abandon ship or change course. Yeah, I mean. If you're supposed to be a, a neutral mediator presenting something that neither side agrees to, it is not a useful. The, a yeah. mediator is somebody who's got to find some common ground. And if you have no agreement, you have no common ground. <laughs> you got to at least have some agreement. Uh, now, I, I, think, I, I really think, and I've argued this for years, the Palestinian side no longer has any leverage. They actually have less leverage than they had before. Except for the threat of, of violence. Uh, well, they, that's not even, the, not even the case, Mark. They used to have a threat of much more violence than they can pull off now. So if you go back to, if you go back to 2003, they had the threat of violence from the Palestinian side was significantly greater than it is now. You now have a security barrier. You now have much more accurate Israeli musician, musicians, musicians. Munitions. You now have Iron Dome. Yeah. Um, you you have numerous things, and you have a Hamas that is that is 
being battered by Egypt. So you're, you're dealing with a, a Palestinian situation in which the militant side of the Palestinian uh, movement is so weakened that the last time they actually tried to launch a military offensive against Israel, they were beaten to shreds with doing very little damage to the Israelis. Yeah. They can't afford that again. They, they really can't afford to have, you know, to try to launch a military offensive and have the Israelis beat it back easily, proving how ineffective they are. So they, if they're going to launch a milita- military anything, they need to be effective in order to make any point whatsoever. And if they know they're not going to be effective, well, then... The, it, the other threat, obviously, is to go back to the United Nations and to weasel themselves into uh, a number of the agencies and... Th- that's that's another strategy to get well, the agencies to not only accept them as full members, but to um, to distance the agencies themselves from Israel. But it's a threat that could be then countered by the U.S. Congress taking action against the U.N. And you also are in a situation where even boycott, divestment, and sanctions proposals are no longer as effective as they otherwise would have been. You're now dealing with an Israel that has that that has natural gas, yes, that has uh, water supply. You're dealing with it that has technology that other countries want and need. Um, you know, to to fully boycott Israel is a complete joke at this point. You'd be in the Stone Age. And uh, uh, I don't I don't think that's what the adversaries want. They simply want either to raise the specter of of this, regardless of how effective it could be. But I mean, I think at this point you're getting to, you're getting to the point where the Israeli response to these threats is bring it on, care. We don't is care. bring it on. Yeah. And, and if you're dealing with that, you don't want you know, Europe can't even act dealing with that stuff. They can't boycott Israeli cell phone technology or medical technology or computer technology that, or satellite that's, technology. But that's extending some sort of rationality to it. Well, I mean, but I, what I'm saying is when you actually get people sitting down and looking at what this means, mm-hmm. they realize it's absurd. You can't have them boycotting Israeli academics either. I mean, what are you going to do, boycott knowledge? You're, you're going to deal with you're going to deal with the dark ages if you do that. So none of this makes sense when you get when it actually gets to the point of how are you going to implement it. Um, in worse than that, the Arab League is sitting here trying to figure out how to support the Palestinians while getting everything solved to the point where they can actually get the Israeli technology that they desperately need. Yeah. Now you're talking about an Israel now that can provide water desalinization technology to enable the entire Arab world to have agriculture. I mean, what kind of revolution would that bring? And, and, and you're dealing with, we're dealing with an Israel that now can, is now going to be the primary natural gas supplier for Jordan and could well end up being a, natural, a major natural gas supplier in, in the coming years for parts of Europe. No one is going to, is going to be able to, uh, to really enforce these anti-Israel academic uh, uh, economic policies. It makes no sense. Right. So the, the entire basis of the movement is no longer is no longer valid. You know, when you are applying that kind of stuff to South Africa, you could isolate South Africa. Yeah, because South Africa didn't really produce anything anybody you, wanted. You can't really of. isolate Israel to no. the extent. I mean, you could diplomatically isolate Israel, but is, if is, the, the, unless you're going to sever ties with the United States completely— you can't really isolate Israel the same way. Mm-hmm. And if you do sever ties with, with the United States completely, Israel can find other friends. There's no doubt they can, because Israel's strategic position right now is such that Russia would love to have Israel or as an China, ally. China, China would love to yes. have Israel as an ally. Yes. And, and so you're dealing with a situation that's simply untenable as far as pressuring Israel now. So I look at this and I say Israel's in a much stronger strategic position. The only, the only real threat against Israel at all is, is the Iranian nuclear weapons program. And if you think about military threat, that's it. And, um, and uh, the Palestinians really have nothing to offer other than what they can concede that's going to get Israel to say it's better than continuing to pull, put up with this stuff. Mm-hmm. And the United States and Europe really have nothing to offer either, other than saying we're not going to allow the Palestinians to harm themselves by trying to do this stuff that's only going to result in economic damage to the Palestinians or right. only result in military damage to the Palestinians. Well, the, the, I mean, the, the two options the Palestinians are threatening 
both result in damage to the Palestinians, either there are either to their economy or to physical damage to their cities, or both. Yeah, the second intifada, however, damaged the the uh, Palestinian economy, and nobody seemed to care. Yeah, but at this care. point, I think they do care. They, you think so? I okay. think the West Bank, they do care. Now, if they now it, if they get to the point where they don't care, yes. The question is, does that make a difference for the Israelis? And I'm not sure that it does. I think it makes much more of a difference for the Palestinian leaders of various factions and to the Europeans who have invested in the Palestinian side. So the, basically the Palestinians would be throwing away what the Europeans gave them, demanding that Israel damage it, and getting nothing in return. And why would the Europeans support that? I mean, strategically, none of this makes any sense. The only thing that really makes sense, and this is from a European side, a European perspective, I think, an Egyptian perspective, and from, uh, from the majority of the Palestinian perspective, is to come up with an, a, an offer that the Israelis can accept. Or to just deal with the status quo and continue to enable everybody to scream and yell about the status quo, but actually change nothing because the status quo is not that bad. Virtually right now, almost any concession that they could make would make, would be worse than the status quo. Um, in some minds, uh, for, uh, for the Palestinian side. Um, but if the Palestinians, um, want to, uh, if they could figure out a way to convince the majority of the population that they can make some of these concessions and actually have an economic cooperation with Israel, their economy is going to boom beyond, way beyond what it is now. They'd be the fastest growing boom nation in the world easily because they're, they have labor, they have an educated labor force, they're convenient to a high-tech economy that needs a labor force. They, they're looking at a huge economic boom from any agreement whatsoever. So there's a huge incentive for them to actually get something done. If you could cut the layer down to the people. If you can get rid of some of this stuff. Yeah. Well, over the past couple of weeks, uh, the president uh, has met with both uh, Netanyahu and Abu Mazen. Uh, we, we saw, for instance, that uh, Netanyahu came to the United States and addressed APAC and had a conversation with uh, with the president, I'm not sure that was particularly worthwhile necessarily, and probably as equally lacking in worthwhileness were the uh, the conversations on March 17th between uh, Abbas and the president. What do you make of that? the the, the Abbas the Abbas stance and what we know in that came out of the the public discussions and uh, where a, a boss went afterwards well i mean look i i think the issue is that the united states is saying what's the big deal of recognizing israel as a jewish state um that the obvious thing is two states for two peoples one's a state for the jewish people one's a state for the palestinian people so what's the big deal this should not be a deal breaker as far as the united states is concerned uh, Although and, the United States has hedged on that too. But part of the reason it shouldn't be a deal breaker is also because the right of return of Palestinians to Israel can't even be on the table. Mm -hmm. And the problem here is if you look at what Abbas has said, it's very clear that Abbas understands that recognizing Israel as a Jewish state means ending the right of return to Israel because he ties the two of them together and every, every time he speaks about it. Well, plus which it negates the Palestinian narrative as well. So, so you're, you're running an issue where the United States is saying, look, it's very obvious that this is a fundamental thing that, can, that is an impediment to any peace agreement. Yes. And unless you're willing to let this go in any kind of a compromise, there is no way we can move forward. Uh, but the, the pressure now is on Israel to try to... Uh, rescind that demand i don't think i don't think so mark not, I th not I a think, serious it's I, I, not a I, serious thing I, I i think i think the issue at this point is as i as i said in a previous show if you know that the peace process is going to collapse the only thing that the united states can do is blame israel for its collapse for for pragmatic reasons for pragmatic reasons yeah. because they if they blame the palestinians for its collapse then then the united, the united states is required to restrict so, its support of the right, palestinians right, right. your you, the united states would be required to urge europe to restrict its support of the palestinians and it would have to act against the palestinians in the un 
Whereas if the United States just says, oh, Israel refused to release X number of murderers at this point, they're reneging on the agreement, and therefore we're it's ending the fault. negotiations, they can blame Israel yeah. without actually changing the status quo. Because despite the fact that everybody says the status quo cannot endure, the status quo always endures until something better changes it. And that, that's at least if the status quo is not... Dynamic. Is, is not a fixed... It, you know, if you're not talking about an absolute fixed situation, you're talking right. about a status quo process. Yes, the status quo process will endure. The status quo, as uh, as facts on the ground, never endures. The status there is no such thing as a status quo. The, the the you you always have change on the ground unless you're going to stop people from giving birth or modifying their the land or buildings or anything else. There's change in in the land automatically, and so this this idea that that the change is that the status quo is somehow completely stagnant is not true. The status quo is of change. And the status quo right now is of Israeli solidification of certain borders, uh, certainly internal borders. Uh, and um, uh, the, the continued reduction of what a Palestinian state could possibly be going forward. And somebody should have told that to the Palestinians in 2000, when they refused the the agreement at Camp David, and ongoing from there, that, that the if they didn't make an agreement, yeah, the then whatever future agreement they would have would likely be worse than the one they have. Except in the mind the one of people get. who simply want to pick up negotiations from where they seemingly hit a roadblock in the well, first place. Well, because they believe that they, they believe that the Palestinians are entitled to all of it, and therefore the Israelis have to continue to give. Yeah. And and what should have happened from the start was an understanding that the Israelis could be could have been making their best possible offer in 2000, and that all future negotiations they could be offering less. And no one has ever understood that. I, I, I don't understand why that's the case. It makes sense in no other negotiation. If, if you make an offer and, and it's your best possible offer, why in the world would there be an assumption that a year later you'd make a better offer? Why wouldn't there be an assumption that you could make a worse offer? Well, uh, the, So, you know, you have Peter Beinert who writes yeah. this thing about, oh, the Israelis aren't even offering what they were in 2008 or 2007, yeah, and they're certainly not best. offering. There because the, the reality is, is that the situation has changed. You know, they used to call... Um, uh, Ehud Barak, the lemon, because the Palestinians would try to squeeze him again for some more. So the, obviously somebody out there believes that the Israelis, due to their status, can always give more. Well, but the, the, the issue very clearly is, one, politically that's not correct. Politically they can't necessarily give more. And two, strategically they can't necessarily give more. And so if you're in a situation with changing facts on the ground, I mean, anybody who expected there to be that Israel would offer more to the Palestinians after Hamas took over Gaza than before is insane. Anybody who would argue that the Israelis would be in a position to offer more to the Palestinians um, than, than after the second intifada is insane. There, there's just no way that, that those two events don't already make it significant, whatever Israel can offer, worse than they did in 2000, and, uh, or at least significantly different than 2000. There is no possible way that you could have some blanket agreement, uh, blanket openness for Jerusalem, uh, for example, in, in, a, in, a, in a future agreement. It's just not possible. The, the, the Palestinian understanding that they can control which Jews come into the old city. The Jews can't even control which Jews come into the old city and, get, and, and not have problems. I mean, we're talking about who gets to pray where at the Western Wall. We're going to have the Palestinians making that decision? Yeah. I mean, come on. Let's, this, this stuff doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's not going to lead to peace. And, and the people who are pressuring, pressuring uh, trying to pressure Israel to make those concessions don't understand the process. You know, it was an article about uh, a week ago that talked about the growing influence of the center. And the, uh, the reality of that being that the center realizes it's necessary to have uh, a Palestinian state, and at the same time, it's an existential threat to have a Palestinian. Well, state. yes, I mean, look, the 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 you know, sane Israelis understand that there needs to be a two-state solution, but they want security out of it. Yeah, 
They don't want, they, they also don't want to control it and have it turn into a welfare state. I mean, they really don't want to be shelling out a huge percentage of the money, not only militarily, but, you know, having to deal with health care and energy and any number of other things that they're getting nothing for. I mean, they're, they're, they're also acting against their own population that is requiring them to be a welfare state and taking action against the Haredi minority that's not putting money in the coffers by working. Much less all the social issues that have to do with the price of uh, dairy products. Yes. I mean, so, so, so from, from the, the Israeli center it sees these things together. They don't see them differently. And they're, they're not going to let the ultra-Orthodox uh, prevent land transfers um, to create a Palestinian state. But they're also not going to just say any Palestinian state is fine with us. They're, they want security. And security is going to require a number of concessions by the Palestinian side uh, that they're, I think, clearly not able to make right now. Uh, How does this uh, fit together with your understanding of the the left of center groups such as uh, labor and even further left of that, merits? Well, merits is a different animal, okay? Merits merits is far left, and, and they're... Uh, you know, they're, they're strongly liberal, um, believing in, you know, the far left social values. Um, but I think they want Israel to take on the risks. And I think they're alone in wanting Israel to take on the risks. I think the Labor Party uh, is actually in agreement with the, the rest of the population as far as that is, if Israel makes an, a, a peace agreement, which they would like it to make, that it would need to maintain security. So you're dealing with it, you know, the people who don't have security as their top priority or as one of the, you know, very top priorities amounts to 2% of the population. Interesting article published by the Associated Press, uh, March 24th, Israelis, Palestinians endorse Arab peace plan. And it talks about a new group formed from the left, essentially, in February called the Prague Forum. Did you, did you read about this? Uh, it says, the group called on the Arab League to make a bold statement in its summit in Kuwait this week, saying this would uh, pressure negotiators to consider the 2002 Arab Peace Initiative. So it's it's the left, again, working with uh, some some people within the, the Arab community, um, on on issues supposedly to to break loose this logjam. Yeah, but let, let's let's be realistic here, Mark. I mean, we're 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 in a situation in which, in order for labor to get elected again and to to actually create a coalition, they have to be able to work with the ultra orthodox and some of the center. Uh, and right now, if they were to even think about supporting any of that kind of stuff, they'd be out of the they Knesset. would be out of it again. They'd yeah. they'd lose even more. I mean, right now, the Labor Party can't even take a stand in favor of national service for the ultra-Orthodox because they're afraid of pissing off their future coalition partners. Yeah. So, you know, you've got a, you've got a situation in which um, the Labor Party is basically hamstrung, having to, having to maintain uh, very center-oriented policies in the hope that at some point they'll be able to be elected. Meanwhile, the poll numbers show... They're the center right growing even against the center left, yes. much less the left. Yes. So um, they that kind of agreement is just not going to happen. What, one more issue there. Uh, within the last month, I believe the Knesset voted in legislation raising the minimum, minimum threshold in which a party needs to have a seat in the Knesset. Yes, which, which will harm merits, harm the, the Arab parties, and it will harm the ultra-Orthodox. The the uh, uh, the rest of the political groups said, "Look, this makes perfect sense for us because we can get that threshold." Yes, and we could certainly combine to get that threshold. It's only the groups that are so radical that they are unwilling to work with anybody else who can't get that threshold. How do you interpret that legislation then? Well, I mean, I think it's it, it in the long run the idea is to stabilize the system. To begin with, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it. I think it makes the system less radical. And look at the United States. In a lot of elections, you have to have, you know, you got to have fifty percent of the vote to be represented, <laughs> right? Right. You got two candidates. One of them's going to get fifty percent of the vote. 
51 percent of the vote and and that's the one that's going to win and in in israel right now you have to have what four percent it i think they just three and a half percent i mean it's you know it's some it's something very very low to be representative well you know what kind of groups would have three percent support in a in an election in the united states you'd have some pretty radical people Uh, that's right Uh, And, and, and then because of the uh the parliamentary system you get into the horse training trading that takes place to try to bring those uh, well, and that's fringe what, groups. Like in. I said, that's what's that's what's hamstringing the the Labor Party and and the left. I I think what's going on right now is that the right wing can operate without Labor Party and mm-hmm. without the Haredi, which yes. is why they're passing the anti Haredi pro secular separation of church and state legislation. Right. Uh, but the traditional separation of church and state activists on the political left can't pass that legislation because they're worried about upsetting their coalition partners who are ultra-Orthodox. So the situation right now is very strange, and it's not conducive to moving forward in a lot of different things because it's also not conducive to moving forward in the peace process because the because what really needs to happen for the peace process to move forward, I think, is for labor to be able to get involved with the center and center-right parties in some sort of center coalition. Yeah. And whatever ends up happening in regard to that uh, is going to be an agreement that prioritizes security or it's going to be nothing. Now, and the, the, American, the Americans know that. I think John Kerry knows that for sure, that anything they propose that doesn't maintain Israeli security isn't getting past the end of the trial period here. You want to shift a little bit to Iran? Yeah, we could talk about Iran. Not not that there's uh, any problems going on in Iran here. This chair is squeaking and squeaking and squeaking that I'm sitting on. Okay. Well, in the midst of uh, the period in which we're trying to hammer out the uh, final status agreement with the Iranians, has there been the much? The nuclear agreement. The nuclear agreement, for sure. Uh, the, the thing I've seen, essentially, is that uh, uh, Iranian... Monetary assets has been increased for the third or so month in a row because the sanctions basically have been lessened to a certain degree, and the Iranians aren't uh, aren't uh, complaining about that. So there have been two different things that the the, the U.S. administration has uh, has said that it accomplished. One of which was reducing the Syrian weapons stockpile, which it has not done. And the other one was preventing the Iranians from continuing on the path toward acquiring a nuclear weapon. And because they haven't finalized the Iranian negotiations, they actually haven't done that. So um, at best, they've slightly temporarily delayed uh, what's going on in certain areas while allowing the, Israel- the, the Iranians to go full speed in others. And the Israelis are saying, well, wait a minute. Uh, we're going to need, you know, there, there are now voices saying we're going to need to act if you don't actually do something. Right. Right. So that that's what we've been hearing, that uh, the defense people in Israel have been saying uh, it doesn't look like we can avoid preparing for the future. And, um, you know, people are trying to use, uh, we were talking about this before the show, people are trying to use this argument that there was a fatwa issued by Ayatollah Khamenei saying that Iran couldn't produce a nuclear weapon. But there's, if you look at the WashingtonPost.com uh, fact checker, um, they're saying, hold your horses. Um, this isn't necessarily true at all. And even if it is, it doesn't mean what people are trying to say that it means. Uh, in other words, a fatwa issued by the Ayatollah could easily be changed by the Ayatollah tomorrow. It doesn't have to. It, it's, not, uh, it's not something that cannot be changed. Uh, and there's even question of whether or not it was actually issued ever. Uh, it's been repeatedly quoted, but basically citing sources that just said that it happened. There's no official source for it. There's no original citation for it. And uh, there's no recording of it ever being said. So, uh, On the other hand, we're obviously in personal information that some sort of information has been given out to indicate that Iran would not use weapons of such a nature against uh, its enemies. Well, that's what that there's this chemical weapons fatwa, and I think some of these things are being confused. Yes, um, there was a fatwa against producing chemical weapons. Uh, 
there's some belief that the assumption that nuclear weapons are banned is actually based on the chemical weapons fatwa, um, which was violated. In other words, that Iran actually was producing all of the things needed to create chemical weapons. They just didn't weaponize it. Well, the, the question then is whether the fatwa had to do with the production of the weapons itself or its conditions of use. Well, I, there's nothing that I see having to do with conditions of use. So um, what I'm seeing, um, if you look through the... If you look through the article in WashingtonPost.com, uh, while there are comments from Secretary Kerry mm -hmm. and senior U.S. officials, um, uh, there's a question of whether or not the fatwa exists and what it says. Um, so, um, for example, um, there... There's an uh, Iranian government's uh, website on its nuclear program has an entire section on the nuclear fatwa. The Iranian website appears to trace the roots of Khamenei's fatwa, which it claims was first issued in 2003, to a fatwa uttered by his predecessor, Ayatollah uh, Khamenei, uh, concerning a ban on um, production and use of chemical weapons during the Iran-Iraq war, but the problem is that Iran admitted to chemical weapons production after it ratified the, treatment, the treaty in 1997, and U.S. intelligence agencies suspected Iran of maintaining a chemical weapons stockpile until 2003. So what does it say if there's a fatwa about chemical weapons that Iran is actively violating? Why is that any different than what it could be doing about nuclear weapons? That's not a good argument. Um, so... Uh, there is no text of the ori original fatwa on nuclear weapons at all, um, which is, you know, you have a culture in which the, the oral tradition is valid, but there's also no recording of the oral tradition. And there's no reiteration of the oral tradition. It's not like Ayatollah Khomeini, Khomeini has said, as I said a year ago, or as I said in 2003, here's what the ruling is. No, they haven't done that. So there's been no support for the fact that there's a fatwa. It's being used, um, and, and it, let's say, just understand, a fatwa is a religious dictum um, that can be changed by the current religious leader so that Khamenei could just change it again without a problem. But as you say, it's being used. Uh, but it's being used as an argument that Iran has no intention ever of acquiring nuclear weapons, never did, and, um, uh, and that this should be reassuring to people when the reality is there's 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 no evidence that that's the case. But but as we all know, uh, diplomats will use whatever they can to justify their particular position, even though there may not be any uh, valid reason to, to suspect that. And, and so here there's another issue. There's a, an issue of translation when dealing with uh, Iran. So. Uh, there's one account of Khamenei talking about nuclear weapons, and the English translation says, we do not pursue to build nuclear weapons, and in reality having nuclear weapons is not to our benefit. From the viewpoint of ideology, theory, and the Islamic jurisprudence, we consider this as forbidden, and proliferation of nuclear weapons is a wrong decision. We consider the use of such weapons as a great sin, uh, while stockpiling it is not only pointless, it is also harmful and hazardous. Therefore, we will never acquire such weapons. But if you look at the actual speech in Persian, um, it says, in fact, nuclear weapon is not economically useful for us. Furthermore, intellectually, theoretically, and judicially, uh, from a Sharia point of view, we consider it wrong and consider this action wrong. We believe using such weapons are a great sin and stockpiling them are futile and harmful and dangerous and never go after it. The big powers know this, but they pressure on this point in order to stop this action, the nuclear program. Okay, so... Um, so what are the differences between those two so, statements? Well, one of them has to do with the, the, the purpose of it, whether or not they're actually doing it. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the author of this um, fact-checker article on Washington Post says, just about every Al Alfred Hitchcock thriller had what he called a MacGuffin, a plot device that gets the action going but is unimportant to the overall story. Mm -hmm. The Iranian fatwa thus appears to be a diplomatic MacGuffin, something that gives the American a reason, the Americans a reason to begin to trust the Iranians and the Iranians a reason to make a deal. 
No one knows how the story will end, but just as in their movies, the fatwa likely will not be critical to the outcome. Even when if, if one believes the fatwa exists and will not be later reversed, which it can be later reversed, meaning this is a promise that can be broken. It's not even, it's not even a promise that there's any consequence to breaking. I mean, that, that's, that, that, should be, that should be readily understood here. Even if, even if it's reversed, it clearly appears to have evolved over time. U.S. officials should be careful about saying the fatwa prohibits the development of nuclear weapons, as that is not especially clear anymore. The administration's statements at this point do not quite rise to the level of earning Pinocchios, but we keep an eye on this issue. Yeah, add to this, of course, what the, uh, the Ayatollah said the other day, basically uh, disputing the existence of the Holocaust. You know, but look, some of the some of this stuff is is just pure ignorance. I mean, I I think in the Arab world there has been such a concerted effort to go to say that everything Jews say is a lie, uh, and anything that could be supportive of the Jews in Israel is a lie. That they've really undermined what truth is, and it's really hard to have negotiations. This is another problem in the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. If you don't believe the same truth, it's really hard to talk about what it means, uh, and. Uh, the, is, the Israeli assumption of what reality is differs from the Palestinian assumption of what reality is. The same thing applies to the Iranian understanding of what reality is. It, you, you cannot assume that everybody has the same understanding of that, or you're going to run into major problems. If, if you don't agree that the sky is blue, then talking about what something looks like in a blue sky is ridiculous. Um, and this is this is the reality. Uh, you know, if you fear that, that the rain is, is is acid rain and that means it's going to eat through your skin and you're not going to go outside to try it uh, to see what happens, you're going to live in a different reality than than other than other people. All you got to do is go ask any psychiatrist who deals with people who are living in alternate realities about how well their patients cope. And if you're dealing with governments that are living in alternate realities because they can't admit the truth of what's really going on in the world. And what's really going on in the stuff they're talking about, you cannot move forward with any kind of policy. The Palestinians cannot make a peace agreement with Israel if they don't have the same reality that the Israelis are living in. Well, that's why we fall back to talking about narratives. Well, and the, the narrative issue is, is, look, there are various ways of looking at truth. Yes. It is not a narrative to deny the truth. That's the problem. I mean, well, if you're, if you're, it is not a narrative to start off and say, Everything that is clearly and justifiably verified, okay, uh, is not true. We're not going to accept that as fact. Here's our fabricated version from fantasy land of what of what true that. That's not a narrative. That is a myth. That is it maybe not even a myth. It may be fantasy land. Now, if you say, well, this is why, if, if you if yeah. your narrative is that um, you know there should be compensation for people who lost property when Israel was formed. That's a valid narrative. If, you're, if your narrative is that vampires and devils came in with the Israelis and sucked the blood out of the Palestinians and they vanished into thin air, that's not a narrative. That's insanity. Well, I, I'm not sure that everybody um, recognizes that distinction, unfortunately. Well, I, I know it's not. I mean, and, and I'm not saying that every Israel, and there are multiple Israeli narratives, too. In oh, fact, no, I'm going to talk sure. about narratives. I'm doing... If you're interested in Israeli-Palestinian narratives, I'm doing a class on Israeli-Palestinian narratives uh, that will begin, uh, let's see, May 15th, I think it is, that Thursday night, whatever that Thursday night is, Mark, we can check. Um, I'm going to do it uh, three, uh, three Thursday nights in a row, and I will be looking at different narratives. Now, I'm not, it's the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th uh, of May at the Temple, uh, 7 o'clock. So if you're interested, you can come to those. Uh, the, the, the issue with narratives is there are valid narratives on both sides, um, different perspectives on what the reality is. You, when you start getting into a situation in which you're dealing with things that cannot possibly be true, that's not a valid narrative. It doesn't matter whether it's the accepted narrative. It doesn't matter if people scream and yell and put their hands over their ears and go, la, 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 la. It doesn't matter. That's not a narrative. It's not a valid narrative. It doesn't have to be respected by anybody. It's not part of the process. 
It really doesn't. I mean, if you demand somebody respect that narrative and make concessions to accept that narrative as part of a negotiation, as part you're of, doing something that's going to be totally ineffective. Right. Well, unfortunately, we, we've come to uh, assume in many places that everybody's culture is to be respected regardless of their narrative. Yeah, but there, there are real narratives and they're not real narratives. There, yeah. there are real Palestinian narratives that 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 are different from the Israeli Palestinian from the Israeli narrative that are valid and important in the peace process. I mean, if you want to talk about the fact that there are Palestinians that, that many Palestinians feel a connection to the Temple Mount and they should be able to have access to the Temple Mount and that there are real religious reasons for for uh, Muslims to be in control of the Temple Mount, yeah. that is a valid narrative. That's an understandable narrative. That's a valid narrative. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to argue that Jews never had any connection to the Temple Mount, that is fantasy land. You're no longer dealing with reality. If you're on the uh, if you're on the Jewish side, and you want to argue that that Muslims never had any connection to the Temple Mount, you're living in fantasy land. Right. I mean, you know. So there there are there are equally crazy narratives on on the Jewish side. It's just that they get pushed aside. They're not the standard narrative. No one is defending those narratives. It, Benjamin Netanyahu is not saying the exact opposite. The, of the narrative that, that Abbas is trying to put forward. He's right. saying, here's a realistic narrative. The Americans are saying, here's a realistic narrative. The Europeans are saying, here's a pro-Palestinian realistic narrative. Yes. And the Palestinians are saying, here's fantasy land. And everybody's like, oh, we have to allow the Palestinians to live in fantasy land. If you let the Palestinians live in fantasy land, there will never be a peace agreement. And, and it's like dealing with somebody who has lost touch with reality. You can't suddenly accept their reality and, and let them live in it and have and expect everything to be fine. They're going to suffer if they continue to live in their reality. And the, as long as the Palestinians can't get to the point where they can, they can live in a version of reality that, the, that, that can allow them to move forward with an actual practical, realistic negotiation, it doesn't matter what what Israel offers as as an agreement. Yeah, it's I guess it's my point that there are, are proponents of a Palestinian cause that don't care what narrative the Palestinians put forward. And well, don't and don't don't defend that because narrative. they like because they don't like the Israelis. It that, doesn't matter what is what narrative the Israelis put forward. Right. And and the, the the political hard part is <clears throat> even part of the valid narrative goes back into uh, the early the early 20th century uh, for which nothing basically can be done against any longer. I mean, you have, you also have the, yeah, you have the early 20th century narrative, which right. is, which is the, the real history of what happened, yeah. which is totally ignored as if it's irrelevant. It's not irrelevant because it demonstrates what's happened when, what happens when Jews live under Palestinian control. That's exactly what that narrative, that's why people avoid that narrative entirely. What happens when Jews are living in a in a Palestinian controlled city of Hebron? They're massacred by people who want to expel them from the land or any number of other places, Jerusalem, Jaffa, you can go on the list. So the reason that history is ignored is because it wouldn't it, it would support a even more radical realistic narrative on the Israeli side as opposed to a moderate realistic narrative. Um, but you know there there are, Lots of, of groups, and they're human rights groups that deal with the Palestinian narrative, a realistic Palestinian narrative that's very harshly critical of Israel. I mean, but it's realistic. Yeah. You know, they say, look, the, you know, the, the length of time people spend at the checkpoints is a problem. The, the flow of, of food and supplies across the border in some places or water, electricity or whatever could be a problem at times. We need to solve these things. There's sewer issues. That's realistic. And those can be fixed. But part of the problem is oftentimes those end up getting bogged down in the fantasy narrative, and so they don't get dealt with. And uh, when you deal with what the solutions are for those processes, you know, the reality is the Israelis could solve a lot of those problems overnight if there was an agreement. Europe can't solve those, those at all. I mean, think about the fact that, you know, you're, you're not going to have Europe step in and provide power for the Palestinians or sewage or water or anything else. All those things are dependent on the Israelis. Yes. You, you need to have the Israelis, in fact, provide economic opportunities for the Palestinians in order for their economy to work after an agreement. 
So this idea that you can have an agreement that doesn't in any way mesh with the Israeli reality is simply, is simply not possible. And until you can convince the Palestinians that the narrative that they've been, they've, they've been uh, dealt, dealt with, they've been taught because of propaganda and anti-Jewish hatred for decades is not only wrong, but it's radically wrong, you're going to have difficulty promoting any kind of peace agreement. And the Israelis are going to have difficulty listening to the valid Palestinian narratives. If it's clouded by because, mythology. Because they can't deal with some of this other stuff. I mean, you know, if there, there are certainly hardship issues that should be addressed by Israel. But if every one of them begins with, you know, your, your blood-sucking demon who, you know, makes matzah out of Palestinian children's blood, uh, you know, as you find in some of these blood libel stories that are totally from medieval insanity— uh, you're, you're not going to be able to move forward in any of these things. That's why probably the most popular of the Palestinian spokespersons on American media, people like Ashrari or uh, Sari Nuseba, tend to be more of the, uh, the, the moderate mainstream rather than even Saib Arakat, who is one of their negotiators who believes he's descended directly from the Canaanites. It's just, I mean, this understanding of, of the, the history of the land is, is totally out of whack. So, uh, listen, this weekend we have some wonderful events in the Jewish community in Des Moines. We have a Friday night service at Tefereth Israel uh, with Josh Nelson and Neshama Kralbach leading the service. Uh, and then uh, Saturday evening at Temple B'nai Deshurin, we have uh, Neshama Kralbach and Josh Nelson doing a wonderful concert at which... I will, uh, at some point, uh, do the shave for the brave. Uh, so if you want to see me uh, appear with no hair, as I will um, more or less in a couple of weeks when we're back on the show. We're not going to have a show next week, by the way, because I will be coming back from the uh, Central Conference of American Rabbis Conference. Uh, but uh, you're welcome to come to the concert. Uh, ideally, you should call the Jewish Federation offices, 987-0899, uh, to make reservations and let us know you're coming Saturday night. And we look forward to seeing you uh, this weekend. And otherwise, we'll be back on the air on April 10th, and we'll see you then. Thank you for watching Rabbi Kaufman's Understanding the World. Get away from us, you mean old credit card. We don't have any more money. We're in trouble now. Save us! Help! Somebody save us! Somebody help! Help! Save us! <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom Coach from Consumer Credit of Des Moines. If your credit card's a little too animated, give us a call. Hooray, we're safe! Consumer Credit, you're the hero! All across America, there are countless numbers of people struggling with addiction and other life-controlling issues. Probably someone you know and love. There is a way out. There is hope. Transformations Treatment Center in Delray Beach, Florida has a unique approach to substance abuse.